Hello, I'm Drew. And I'm Matthew. And welcome to another episode of Made in Common, where we explore other paths in life through the sharing of others' stories, decisions, and careers. Our guest was Tristan Bagri, who left his corporate job to found his own accounting firm, TSB CPA. I can personally attest to Tristan's honesty, humbleness, and professionalism through our numerous conversations over the years. And in this episode, it will become apparent as we reflect on his path to taking the leap in starting his own firm. We explore topics such as how he overcame being an introvert at a young age, attribution and lessons learned at previous jobs, and how his mindset has evolved over the years to conquer mental barriers, anxieties, and social pressure. I think this episode will be relevant not only for accountants, but really for anyone feeling stuck in a corporate environment and exploring other paths and thought processes. A friendly reminder that we don't always align in our views, but we are all made in common. So please respect our guests and respect each other. If you'd like to support us, for now, you can subscribe and leave a rating on whichever platform you're listening to. For written feedback to us or questions for our guests, the best bet is to leave a comment on our YouTube channel. And now, let's enjoy the episode. Well, I think this is interesting because we had talked about this already, but this is the first time you've seen my face, Tristan. Yeah. And I reached out to you, but all the conversations we've had in the past, it was just like, <laughs> I never turn on the camera and that says something about my internet privacy paranoia, but how does it feel? Is this weird for you? I think watching the first podcast you released before, I got used to it, but like first seeing it, I was like, oh, that's true. So it was a little bit weird, but... Yeah, it was good to put like a uh, face to the name and the voice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't turn on my camera either if I wasn't like I have to turn mine on <laughs> as when we go through that stuff. But so, so was yeah. Jude? Was Jude met your expectations? What he looked like? <laughs> After all I see my expectations. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Low expectations already. Uh, <laughs> Did you actually uh, think I was a DJ? I don't know, not. Okay, your picture was that image of, uh, I guess you said a lesso. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> that's all I would show on the screen. I was like, this guy must <laughs> DJ. I was like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> then I asked you, and I guess you uh, don't DJ. <laughs> unless you want to, unless you want to mix something up for us right now. <laughs> oh, man, I'm, I'm down, but it's going to be a disaster. Sorry, I, I yeah. cut you off, Matthew. What were you going to say? I oh, know, it's just, it's just funny because, like, when I was looking for some tax help, I remember Drew, you were like, hey, look up this Tristan person. I'll do an introduction. I think our very first meeting, I just we just turned on our cameras. So. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I knew I saw Matthew right away. I was like, okay, I know this guy. I've seen this guy. I haven't seen Drew yet, but. He was this weirdo, yeah. yeah. It's okay. It's, my, it's only no. my second time seeing Drew. <laughs> <laughs> this might not even be me. I just got some AI thing. It could be. Rendered that looks like me. I don't know. These Are days, you uh, know. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. We can get into that later if we want. <laughs> Are you, you're generally a pretty private person too, Tristan? Because you mentioned you wouldn't even turn on the cam. I mean, to an extent, but I don't, I don't share like a, a ton of stuff, I guess. But internet wise, I'm not too paranoid. Some people are, you know, they won't upload anything to Google Drive or they'll like get an Android phone or de-Google it. For me, Google or someone wants my information, like, whatever. They can have it. What are they going to do with it? But generally, I mean, to an extent, but I guess more sort of laziness is why I uh, would don't turn on my camera. It's kind of interesting, though, because we were doing research for you, and then there wasn't actually that much, man. You actually do maintain a pretty tame internet footprint. So props to you. I, I, You know me. I'm terrible with internet paranoid privacy paranoia why the hell am i doing this show like this is one thing what is, what is wrong i'm like breaking all my boundaries for this but yeah yeah well, what were you guys searching are we, what were you trying to find there i don't know it's just more more things that, about you that we might know it's to ask you about right and then yeah. we yeah i try not to have a bunch of social medias and stuff just like your standard facebook instagram but other than that i'm not too into that 
I don't even think we found those. Like you just, you you found your site. You did a good job with that. The SEO is hitting that and your YouTube channel. Awesome. I don't, I don't know anything about SEO. So glad you even found the site to be honest. (laughs) Well, I think one of the things that you might've mentioned to me before was like, you're actually quite introverted, right? So like how uncomfortable was that for you to just put yourself out there? Like you got a site, you got a YouTube, other boards. Like how difficult was that? It was really weird for me. I had to like think about it quite a bit before I kind of just jumped in. Cause like even with the other site, even like Facebook or LinkedIn, I'd never really posted before. For those types of social sites, I've never really put myself out there like that. And then I guess when you're starting a business and you want to gain clients, you don't really have a choice, right? You kind of just, you have to put yourself out there. You have to kind of do some of those things that make you a little uncomfortable. But I think the hardest part is just trying to be authentic and just present yourself in a way that you want others to see you. I guess it's hard in that respect, just doing that. Getting those first posts out, getting the website out, just talking about what I do. Like, okay, I'm doing this now. If you know anybody, you know, feel free to recommend me. That stuff has gotten easier now, but in the beginning, it was it was really, it was kind of tough. I really had to think about it. Or it was interesting because yeah, I am really introvert. I don't know about you guys. If you guys are like introverts or extroverts. But you might be able to guess for me. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, probably you're pretty extroverted. You do run into podcasts, I probably guess. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually quite introverted, but uh, yeah, I guess I get mistaken for extrovert quite a bit because I'm I'm decent at talking, I guess. But Matthew, how would you classify yourself? I think definitely probably introverted. I mean, yeah. the only time I really spoke out was I was forced to part time jobs, did a lot of Best Buy. So it was just like, oh no, gotta talk to people. So <laughs> it yeah. got a little bit easier over time. Yeah, it's funny you like mentioned that. So in high school, I would say I was super introverted. Just kind of talk, didn't like really put myself out there. But then after high school, I started working at a call center for some local phone company. Really, a typical Indian guy working at a call center. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like through that, I was talking to people on the phone constantly, right? So that really helped me learn how to have conversations not be as shy and just like talking to customers right like more customer service so yeah that was like something that that i think really changed things for me it was a step in that direction but yeah it's still taken a long time to kind of open up more kind of get get to where i am now i still like to kind of just do my own thing right i'm still like introvert but not as much as before, I would say. It's interesting because, well, I guess I have to apologize to whoever's going to listen to this later because we're going to be jumping all over the place. There's no real set timeline for these conversations, so I hope you're okay with that, Tristan, but I'm just going to fire off questions that I feel are, are relevant for where we're talking right now. So it's kind of awesome you brought that up, but going back in high school, you were introverted, and this seems to be a common theme where it's really that first externally facing job that really brings it out of you for me i can't help but be curious that introverted nature or that shy nature let's say was that from upbringing were you always like that or is it uncomfortable for you to share if like something happened to you maybe that maybe you didn't like being more extroverted or it's interesting question i think i was it's just how I've always been. I'm the youngest sibling, so I think a lot of people are older than me in my family. So maybe that has something to do with it. But I just kind of like to sit back and watch, I guess. Are they more extroverted? Is the rest of your family quiet? Some of them, some of them not, I would say. I think on this, if we look more like my siblings, I'm probably on one side of the spectrum. And then okay. my, other, my sister is probably on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> and my other sister's in the middle, I would say. Okay. So I guess, you know, like the Goldilocks thing, one for one in yeah. each place. But um, what about you? Well, 
It's in, that's an interesting question, actually. For me, I don't know. I actually don't know what I am at heart. I think I am a fusion at heart, but just molded by my upbringing and what I was told how to behave in public situations. There were a lot of times when I was younger, I really, I really love humor and, and I really love laughing. And there were even times where I was like, laughing was too much even in situations. I don't want to paint that horrible of a picture, but my personality was a little suppressed, I would say, especially in my immediate conditions. But at school, I was a class clown. I love making people laugh and stuff. So I don't know actually what I am and I don't know what causes what. But I think right now, if you were to go with the classical definition of what gives you more energy, I do need a lot of time to recharge. After a night out, oh man, I'm out for the counts for a few days, I think. <laughs> Especially now. Yeah, how about you, Matthew? Yeah, I think it was, I think definitely growing up, I think my dad was more reserved. And he was probably in the early, in the early days was more on the rule set. So it was almost like follow the rules type of thing and just kind of keep to yourself. So I think growing up was a little bit like that. My mom is very different. She's very extroverted. I think as I got older, she's just like, oh, you're just being way too quiet, Matthew. <laughs> it's time to speak more and just get out of your comfort zone. So I probably started doing this more later in more of my high school days. And that's kind of where it pushed me to first job in like high school, like early university was, you know, just try to go for these sales type of jobs. And that was really, really uncomfortable for me. I think I only, I only got the job because I was nerdy enough and knew what computers were and knew how to talk about it. So I think the manager was like, ah, he knows his stuff. We can teach him how to talk type of thing later. So, <laughs> and yeah. it just started developing after that over, over some time. It was very uncomfortable for me, but I guess talking to people at the end of the day, even if you feel awkward, there wasn't a lot of like punishment for it. It's just like, okay, it's just, you might say something stupid, but it's not the end of the world after that. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting because like, back when you're younger, I think, or especially me, you kind of are more concerned about what people think. Mm -hmm of you or what you think, or what kind of music you listen to or anything stupid like that, like what you wear, right? Like you're kind of more wanting to be like everyone else or do what people think will look, make you look cool or whatever, right? And then as you get older, you're like, who cares? Yeah. I'll do what I like. I have like, us put a sword behind me. My wife's like, <laughs> why do you have a sword? Look stupid. Oh, I like it. I don't care. <laughs> It's so awesome. But <laughs> things like that, right? And I think that as well, sometimes it's hard. You don't know what's a genuine conversation, what's a genuine connection or something until you've experienced it. And then also just in groups, I just, I don't, I prefer not to like be really social in a group. It's just, just, I just can't, it's harder, right? But like when is, when it's something like this, like a couple people, like one person, it's easy to just be a little more social, open up. And I don't know how you guys find, if you guys find that or not, but for me, I think that's kind of like a big thing. There is something about like, it's almost that age old wisdom where I don't know if it's age old, but it's some common knowledge where it's almost easier to confide in a stranger because mm -hmm. they don't know who you are. And so at work, they don't really know your history that much. And it feels almost like it's easier to to let loose at times. You got to be professional, so you got that professional face, and then you got that, you know, you can let loose around people you feel comfortable with. But it's interesting because one thing I wanted to raise is we haven't actually talked about ourselves that much, but me and Matthew are, you know, we're devs, so computer science. I have history. Matthew has history before that, but that's how we met, and I would say that's probably still the biggest bulk of how we would classify ourselves but there's a little bit of a misnomer where in in this world now where there's so much digital communication a lot of people wonder you know are there jobs where i don't have to interact with people because i am quote unquote ex introverted and i don't want to talk to people but it seems like there's a common theme because even for devs you have to communicate it's one of the most important things it's so, so overlooked. And I think, again, to hammer that point home, you just, 
something needs to bring you out of that comfort zone. And for all of us, it was some sort of public facing job, right? I'm not telling everyone to go and apply to McDonald's or a call center or something, but find something to bring you out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah, I don't know. What what do you think would have happened if you didn't get that call center job, Tristan? I don't know. I think I'd figure it out eventually. Like, you could have to, right? Don't get me wrong. Like, like that experience helped me a bit, but I still then went to. I didn't talk to anyone really. I didn't make very many connections. I was just there to study, get my work done, like get the hell out of there. Um, because it sucks going going to school. <laughs> Looking back on it there's a missed opportunity because that's where you meet a lot of people that then go on enter the workforce or whatever they might not even be in that field any in that field they studied they studied for anymore they might be doing something completely different uh, really interesting right but uh, yeah during that time now i look back and i'm like wow i should have kind of made more of an effort to connect with some more people just keep in touch with them but yeah it's it like it's Even funny my- you mentioned that, like, I was reminiscing with someone earlier, and that is also one of my biggest regrets, was just going to school and getting the hell out of there as soon as possible, right? And uh, a lot of the talk now is that, like, what is the point of universities, right? Because there's a lot of talk about student debt, and a lot of degrees that cost too much and don't provide enough value. But at the end of the day, I think it really is that alumni network relationship that you build and you meet a lot of people that can be pretty close to you for a lot of your life and i took that for granted man and i think i don't want to talk about myself too much but yeah definitely the first few years of university was like a big regret i just got the hell out. that's why i was so miserable too right just go home and and sulk <laughs> but maybe i could have met some you know uh a very nurturing group there. I have no idea. It's too hard to tell now, but it is one of the regrets I have was being that kind of person. I wanted to ask a little bit about, so you mentioned you went to BCIT, right? Yeah. How did you decide on which school to go to and like what field to go to? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. This kind of goes back. I didn't, I always liked investing. I'm not like some I don't like spend all my time investing or looking at stuff now, but back then when I was like a kid in like grade seven, my dad kind of started telling me about like investing and it was just interesting to me the way that you can make more money from a little bit of money by just letting it sit there, interest, whatever, earning a return on something, um, to read into it, different books, whatever, like maybe I didn't know what the hell any of that stuff meant, but I don't know, it was just an interesting concept to me. And I think from there, like, even in grade seven, actually, this is kind of unrelated to that, but one time the teacher brought in somebody that, I guess it was like about entrepreneurship, and they brought in like all these different pieces of a pen, and then we just sat there assembling it, and then they were saying, okay, now you can sell this, right? <laughs> it's a business, I guess, a little stupid example, right? But through that as well, I was like, okay, well, that's interesting. You can kind of create something and go out and make some money for it or do something with it. So throughout high school, that was kind of what I, what I liked, right? Just like investing all that stuff until grade 10 came out along and the Call of Duty came out. Call of, no. Call of, Duty. <laughs> Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Oh no. That's a good one too. <laughs> Later on in high school, where I was like, okay, well, I got to get, get things together here. I got to figure out what I want to do. But I always wanted to do something for myself. I didn't know if I'd be able to do it or not because I'm just very conservative. I've never been around that. So I thought, okay, I like investing. I'll try financial planning. So that is actually what I went to school originally for in BCIT. But the first year in BC, at that time of BCIT for any like thing of accounting, financial planning, any type of finance stuff is all the same. So 
you could easily switch and you're not behind right yeah. so yeah that's that's how i got into financial planning and also during that time i really liked the accounting side of things you guys obviously know warren buffett but like he's a big investor and he was somebody that i was always reading his books seeing what kind of things he was saying and one big thing that he said is that in order to be a good investor you need to fully understand accounting and i thought okay well i want to be a good investor so yeah i mean based on that i kind of just in the second year of bcat after i finished that first year in financial planning i switched over to accounting all the courses in the first year were the same uh, i decided okay i'll go with accounting if I like it, I'll continue with it. If I don't like it, I can always go back and do financial planning. Is it fair to say you kind of discovered what you love at an early age, if that's investing or something in that umbrella? I don't know if I'd say <laughs> I love it, but it's some, something I, li I like. I think I'm good at it. But if money wasn't an object, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'd be doing. Like I'd probably be doing, like sitting on some beach somewhere, but... You know. <laughs> I think if I look back out of all the things I could have done, it's hard to really, for me to pinpoint would I have done better at something else? Would something else have been the right path? Because just looking at something on the outside looking in, you don't necessarily know all the struggles with it, like all the things that you wouldn't like, right? I didn't know an account before I went through into accounting, which I mean, it's probably stupid. I should have known this, but if you're in, in tax, there's a tax season. And <laughs> the first four months of your life, you're just working yeah. four months of the year, right? Or yeah, there's long hours. I'm sure every office job, like, there's unpaid overtime if you're working with some, for someone else. If I look at other careers, look at engineering, like you know, depending what you're doing, maybe you can learn how to design things or make things or construct things. And maybe you can invent something. I don't know, right? Or like, medicine seems like a pretty cool career to be a doctor but then i think they work like six days a week right so looking about it how about it now like i think i am happy where where i am at this point with the path i chose and i think it's the path that i had would have had like the most interest in when i went to bcit i, I knew this is what what i want to do i want to just get through it as fast as i can get out of school and start working so i finished like the degree in three years. So I got out of high school, went went there. We did like seven courses, master. That's just kind of how I, all the programs are at BCIT. I just like hammered through it, finished it, got into a workplace. And then that was another thing. I, I started my full-time job in accounting. I was like 21, right? Oh. So yeah. it's like kind of young and you're working with people like a lot older than you. So it's it was it's intimidating. Weird. Like pretty intimidating? I would say so, yeah. Like it, it felt intimidating because you're fresh out of school and you don't know anything. Like you know <laughs> everything that like the textbook tells you, right? And that's all good technical knowledge, but applying it is something completely different. I'm sure it's that's the case with like every single field. And then when you're talking to people, when you're talking to managers or partners or just senior staff, members above you you need to i think you need to have like a little bit of confidence yeah but it's a little bit difficult if you don't feel that you're comfortable right at, at that point or you're not used to it so it took a while to get used to and just learn like okay if i don't feel comfortable how am i going to approach this and i just learned all right before i go approach something i'm going to write everything i know about this topic down just make sure i'm prepared and then go in like that and then now I find if I do that and I'm prepared, I don't have any trouble discussing it. And that's just what I, that's the same thing I do now for a client meeting. Sometimes clients like to meet in person and I'm happy to do that, but it's easier for me to just meet like this virtually. I have my notepad in front of me. I have, <laughs> like, write things down. I can see everything. But yeah, you I guess you got an analytical get... mind, right? Like you have a very analytical mind, so it's easier for you, I guess. I guess so, yeah. I can't just sit there and just like, like BS or kind of shoot the shit. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, like some guys can do that, but it's not, it's not something I'm comfortable with. 
That's actually interesting you mentioned that because one would assume that, so maybe we're jumping forward a little too fast, but one would assume that you're mentioning clients and you have your own business now, that you kind of have to build that shoot the shit, small talk skill. But I can personally attest that like, I think one thing that struck me about you is that you have this calm, chill, to the point demeanor, but you're also inviting. You're also like, listen, I'm here to help you first. We can talk about the weather after, right? Yeah. I think there's a lot of, what do you call it, public speaking skills or emphasis on people being able to be charismatic, but some people take that the wrong way and are just like, oh, that means I should be able to bullshit. And I just wanted to applaud you because, you know, what we've learned so far, you were very introverted. You don't really like group settings and stuff, but now you're out there. And you mentioned you didn't want to do the role of sales and stuff, but you kind of have to, right? With your own, your own gig. But I just wanted to applaud you first, and then I'm going to actually put a stamp in it. Because I'll save how you got into your own business for a little bit later, but I'm actually very curious to hear about more of your work experience at a young age. 21 is young, man. So what happened there? What kind of feelings did you have and what can you recall from that history? Yeah, no, I appreciate what, uh, what you just said. But yeah, I mean, like I, I went into it and before that as well, before getting a job, like I, I kind of was scrambling to get a job like at that time because school ended and uh, I finished the degree was March or April, whenever the semester ends. And usually for accounting, you go through something called recruit, which is one year prior, you'll meet with the firms and the big firms and network with them and all that stuff. And then usually they'll hire you starting for the next year or a co-op or something. But I just wanted to get this, this stuff done. I think I don't care about any stuff. So yeah. I completely just didn't even pay attention to that. Uh, recruiter or all that and honestly I didn't even know what I want if I wanted to go into uh, there's two sides of accounting right so your first guest that was on Albert I think uh, he's in like a different side of it where I think it's more of like you're working for a company your corporate accounting like management accounting or analyst type of stuff and then there's working for a firm where you're doing taxes or audits for other bunch of other companies so I was like do I want to go that route or do I want to go to the firm route, work for a firm? So yeah, I figured I'd want to just like work for a firm, learn tax. So I really enjoyed my tax course. So that's- Wait, I just want to quickly interrupt because you, you mentioned that clear distinction. So the firm side, I'm still quite naive with accounting, even though I know so many accountants. So does that, is that associated with like that big four? They always mention the big four. Is that the firm yeah. side then of accounting? Yeah, so well, it's called public practice. Oh, okay. Those are the largest accounting firms in the world, like PwC, KPMG, Deloitte, EY. So yeah, those are the big four. So that's what you'll always hear. Everyone wants to go big four, mainly because... No, I went to first, I guess, a regional firm, like a, like a firm downtown. They have a few offices in BC. And then I went to, I guess, like a big six. So they're still a global firm, but... They're like, there's, then there's BDO and Grant Thornton. So I was, I, and I was with one of them, but I guess the thing is that everyone wants to go to those big firms is that you get more exposure or you could potentially get more exposure. Depends where you're at, right? If you're doing like big audits or something, then if you want to work with the largest companies in the world or work on their audit, you're probably going to have to be at a big four, but if you're doing tax work for owner managed businesses, it doesn't matter too much. Did you know go... that? Did you know that when you were younger though? Or sorry, the real question maybe I should reframe was like, did you have some sort of conception of I want to get into the big four when you were younger, but now you realize that might have been a misconception or did you, were you always like, ah, it doesn't matter? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know anything about it until probably when I started going into re recruit or like when I was starting to look for a, a job or it might sound stupid. I went through the whole program and didn't really pay attention to the end goal of it. But looking at it now, 
I mean, you do get a lot of opportunities working with the, the big uh, firm, even what your other guest was saying, when you're applying for jobs, there'll be a lot of places specifying a oh, big four experience or, or something like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just like your foot in the door sometimes, but if you have good experience, like if you worked anywhere else, you get that interview, then it's just on you to kind of just deliver yourself. It doesn't really matter too much where you work. You could be doing the same shit. If you're working big four, or you're working a small firm, right? Um, sometimes you might even have better mentors de depending where you're at. So I guess it's more so the team you work with, the people you work with. The first firm I work with in the tax group, there's some really smart people there. And yeah, learned a ton over there. If I worked at a big four, would I have learned more? I doubt it. Like I, I don't, I really don't think so. so I, think I think that's pretty important, man. I think that's yeah. actually really important because you might be special in that you didn't think about the big four until you were already in job hunting phase. But I think just personally speaking and knowing of people that went that route and also knowing there's something very similar in something like the software industry where the, there's not really a big four, but there's big tech, right? Where you have the same aspiration. But I think there is a strong misconception when you're younger and you have this, this weird false idol. It may be false, it might be not false, but you have this conception that when you go to these big places, they're really going to train you well because you are important to them. But the bigger the company, there's a, even less chance that someone higher up even knows who you are, right? So I think that's really important that you highlighted that. It could be false. It's going to be case by case, right? Some people might have a really good mentor within the company, but chances are just mathematically when you're at the smaller place, you get to work with someone that has quite a bit of autonomy at the company, I would say, right? Does that, does that resonate? Yeah, I mean, both the firms I worked at were large, like the, the second one for sure, Grant Thor, it was, it was really big. It's pretty much similar to a big four. Okay, got it. And then the company before that, like, they're still like pretty big that nobody, I don't know if anyone really calls shots. It's a collective thing, right? So you don't really see... It doesn't feel like it's a small run business that you learn th those things. But I do think that people get really hung up on wanting to work for a really big shop. I don't know if it's sometimes it's warranted, right? Like sometimes it's unwarranted because it depends what really what you want to do. For me, I knew that I wanted to do my own thing. When I was in BCIT, I knew I didn't want to work for someone. I want to eventually do my own thing, whether that's in accounting, whether that's in something else, whatever. But that was always the goal. And then going into tax, that was me seeing that I can use these skills on my own and open a business with it or something like that, right? But if somebody's going in with the intent that they want to one day work for Google or Amazon, something like a big public company, then going to the big big firms is going to help you. It's definitely going to help you because they, they prefer that kind of experience. And you see larger companies, maybe one of those big companies is even going to be your client on the big audit. And then if they're your client on an audit and you've worked for them, sometimes they'll offer you a job to work for them, right? So it's, it's a lot of people's way in. But if you don't get a job at a big firm right away, just take a year or two, gain the experience in your firm you're at. And if you really want to go to a big firm after, they're going to hire you. Everyone's desperate for <laughs> senior accountants or managers, whatever, right? Because getting in is, hard, is a little bit hard. Because you don't know anything. But once you're trained up, you know what you're doing, you can get in. Like, it's not, it's not a big thing. So I think seeing that after, when you're in school, like, you're, you're, head, you're in such, like, a narrow space of thinking because you've never seen anything. You just know what people have told you or what Reddit says, right? And it's just not good advice. Or you know what your instructors are saying, which is, it's probably nothing because they haven't been in the industry in so long. Like, most of them are just teaching full time. Yeah. So once you kind of get out of that and you just take a look, it's like there's opportunity anywhere. Like you just have to put the effort in, you'll find it, connect with somebody. Like I think that's one of the best ways to get a job. Like if you have a good connection with somebody and they're hiring, I think there's a greater chance of you getting 
your foot in the door to be able to then go and work there right and that, that kind of comes back to like making connections while you're in school because if you make a genuine connection and you continue to service that connection you're going to have a lot more opportunities like if you, if you open your own business or something because that person may be an accountant or they might end up uh, doing IT or something or they yeah. might become a financial planner who has their own big book of clients who now needs like a good accountant for their clients right it resonates really well because it's the same thing I know in tech there's always people like oh you just gotta be you know smooch up to the, the senior developers or the managers who cares about this junior developer there 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 are nobody there but a lot of people forget everyone's starting at different times in their career and i work in the software services industry and you'd be surprised the people who are quote unquote junior the nobodies that you really talk to as they progress through their career you know people are moving up right and exactly what you say when they need to help and you establish that nice connection it's like hey hey buddy we need some help here hey do you mind helping us out because like they're they're in a they're in a position of like decision at that point right so it's almost like all type of networking is is equally important at this stage would you <laughs> say it's similar in your field the cutthroat to get in a lot of people targeting one two like a few companies that they want to work for there's this, I guess you've probably heard of like fang companies. So yeah. every person in the tech in, in school, they're probably like, oh, it's, it's, it's do or die. It's fang. And if I don't get into fang, it's the end of my career. I think that's, again, it's definitely exaggerated. It's not like it's the end of your career, right? Sure. But that, that is the perception, right? There's a lot of people who, if you don't get into fang, you can, you can get experiences elsewhere and you can still get in there. Cause again, it's really hard to find people at the end of the day, but I guess when you're the student, it is really just, I must get into this company or else it's, it's doomsday at that point. <laughs> yeah. At that point, it's just difficult, right? You just haven't been exposed to enough to just understand it's easy now to talk with hindsight, but when you're in that position, it just kind of feels like your back's up against the wall. Oh my God. Like, what am I going to do now? No one's going to hire me. I need, need a job. Like I needed that. If I go into this small little place i'm gonna be like pigeonholed here <laughs> this is not true i don't think like oh i think it's actually the opposite right because yeah. like i know a lot of these fan companies they'll purposely hire from these startups why because in startups you usually i mean there's not enough money to hire a specialized role for each kind of position right so you tend to wear multiple hats and you can sometimes argue that a lot of the startups they have more of this entrepreneurial spirit right bigger companies not saying they're not entrepreneurial but hey if i'm just an algorithm guy and i know how to write really optimized algorithms maybe that's all i do in this big company but it's always more complex than that right so you'll often see these larger companies being like you know what we kind of know the vibe of culture these other candidates are coming from the big four like these other big companies they're purposely not going to hire them because they just need to balance out their teams with a kind of different mindset or experience base so it is, yeah, yeah it is. I, I definitely think it's all equal for all positions here. Yeah, for sure. I think it just come, at the end of the day, it just comes down to what someone wants to do. Like yeah. in the big companies, I found that in accounting as well. If you're in a really big firm, you might only be doing one certain type of thing, right? If you're in tax, you're in tax. If you're in audit, you may have never filed a tax return in your life. And that might be fine, right? You might go all the way to make manager make partner and then be really specialized in that and make a lot of money but if that's not what you want to do with your life then there's other op opportunities as well why do yeah. you think that is when you're younger i just wanted to return to that point you made where when you're younger it feels like your back's against the wall and you got to get going you got to get going it's like every step you make seems so significant i'm just i'm trying to put myself in your shoes you're like 2021 that's really young right and even if you took like a year off it's not even that big of a deal 21 and 22 but then when you're at that stage of life i don't know why what do you think that is when you're younger and you, you feel like you gotta make that really important crucial decision right now what is that yeah i think it's really individualized different people have different mindsets on that i know people that took a break after high school but then they 
started doing something that they seem to really like now and they're really doing really well at it and it was something that benefited them right for myself i didn't think it was an option but i kind of in my wrong way of thinking just thought okay if i'm not doing going to school i'm not doing something if i'm not doing something i'm further from my goal of what i want to do or where i want to be and i think it was just looking at things in a very future orientated perspective which was good for where it kind of got me and it's good for now but it's also bad because you lose out on remembering to be present in all the situations so I guess there's like there's a bit of a trade-off which I didn't understand at that time. If I if I could go back, would I change anything? No. I still do it like that. I guess <laughs> it is what it is. Like I'm fine with it. There's there's no regret or anything, but you know, there's I think there's room for a little more balance. I guess it just comes down to the the person, right? I I don't think my parents would like if I wasn't going to school, I don't think they would have liked that very much either. They paid money for me to get here. They taught me things. They sent me to school. I, f I just felt like I should be doing something as well, right? Otherwise, I'm kind of wasting their time and like efforts. How much and do you think that played a part in it? Like that family pressure? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I call it pressure, but just more so feeling that, that it's important for me to kind of just get things done. And... Having said that, I, I still have two older siblings and they were both work, like went to school. Actually, my other sister's an accountant as well. She did like the BCIT route. She, she started working. So I actually, I saw that and that probably influenced some of my decisions and stuff as well. But yeah, I just saw them working. I wanted to just start working. Like I wanted to finish school. I didn't like being in school. I hated being in school, like studying. I did not want to study anymore. <laughs> I, I didn't want to study while I was studying, but I just needed to get it done so I could just get to the other side of it. I think that what was you, mainly what propelled me there. I always hear how intense BCIT is. Do you, maybe we can spend a little bit of time because first of all, I just realized we've had a ton of guests that love BCIT or have gone there at least and credit a lot of their careers and, and success from it. But I think there's like, Oh man, I don't want to hammer this home again, but there's a misconception that because it's easier to get into a school that it's less stressful than let's say a UBC or SFU or some university program, right? But you like seven courses of BCIT, that's insane. And I, I've heard lots of similar stories and you did articulate that it's very practical as opposed to theory heavy. What, are, what else can you comment on for BCIT? Like, what did you appreciate about it? Or what, what do you think it could have done better? I guess I just appreciated that. I don't know. I, I, for the most part, I felt like my time wasn't wasted. I was just doing stuff that I needed to do. And when you're going for a job, at the end, what's the end goal? The end goal is to get a job. The end goal is to know something not just to walk out with some piece of paper, right? So I like the practical aspect of it because that's what I want out of it. But but yeah, when I got out of school, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. People are still at the same jobs. No one from the, any other school seemed to know any, anything superior to anyone else, right? Like everyone's at the same level. We did the same course as a CPA organization or like the Western School of Business or whatever mandates what courses need to be taught in the accounting programs no matter what school you're going to because it's a requirement to get then get into the cpa western school of business to start doing your cpa so the curriculum i from my understanding is all the same like in some courses as well uh, i don't know if other schools did this but bcat would give notes so you would have notes along with your textbook stuff it was helpful because I'm not spending my time writing notes unless I really have to. Like all the important stuff is there. It's all I care about, right? So very yeah. optimized. <laughs> <laughs> so you alluded to this earlier, but you always wanted to do your own thing and you did eventually start your own business, but maybe give us a short recap of what led to that happening. 
you already knew you wanted to do it, but did something happen at work or how did you manage to take that leap into finally deciding to do your own business? Yeah, I think going in, it always was in the back of my head when I started working that I, it's something that I wanted to do. Just wasn't sure when or how long it would take because you need to develop a certain technical knowledge and just be comfortable with things. And who knows how long that could take. And I think when pe one thing is that when you start, you might think, okay, it might take 10 years to be this guy that I work with or whatnot. It could seem like it's just like forever down the line. But I think you, if you go in with a mindset that you only want to learn what you feel is important, it will help you a lot. And that's kind of what I was doing. I was focusing on certain aspects that I think would have been important to me because when you're working for somebody in this field uh, and probably in other fields, they're using you essentially, especially in accounting, you're coming in and you're getting paid a small salary to compensate for you not knowing much, you being fresh out of school. And then as your skill goes up, your salary is not necessarily going up at the same pace. Maybe you get bumped every year or something, but yeah, I think a lot of people we're getting get, get hung up on just doing learning what what they want you to learn but you can ask your employer that, that you want to learn certain things or show interest in different areas right so you can kind of guide it because at the end of the day in my opinion they don't care about you right if you died tomorrow your employer would they care? They'd probably replace you. Like they probably care a little bit. <laughs> like, <he's> so ruthless. <laughs> But for real, though, would they even show up to your funeral? Like, yeah, I know, I, know. I, I, I get what you mean. Because yeah. <laughs> I work with people that I work with a lot. They were a partner at a firm, and the guy didn't know my name. Yeah, so yeah you're like a number. That he didn't know my name. You're like a number to them, right? It, yeah. it, it's, it's, I guess I will add a special caveat that if it was a small company, then they probably would know you better. But at a like, kind of like what I alluded to earlier, at a big place, like you're just you're easily replaceable. You're like a cog in the machine. So yeah. to your point, man, totally. It even depends. I was in the, that office every three times, every third day, you guys barely knew my name. So <laughs> some people are just like that, right? And those things made me want to just do my own thing. I didn't want to have somebody tell me what to do, when I can go on vacation, why I'm sick, right? Like, <laughs> And I don't know if your guys' field or not, if there's a lot of overtime that has to be done and if you're compensated for it or not. But in accounting, some places you're compensated, but it's not like you're compensated at a time and a half, right? You might bank straight overtime, but a lot of places you're not. There's no overtime, right? Yeah. So when you're looking at it, like, what are you getting paid for what you're putting in? So yeah, like, just based on that, what I, I just wanted to kind of get out there, do my own thing. Eventually, I just felt like I was ready. And I wasn't working on a firm anymore at this point. Like I, I switched to a different type of job briefly on the other side of things, where I was just like regular account working for one company, doing one thing. And then I started on the side just to try to establish myself because I was too scared to make a full jump. Right, like I've I've only ever done the technical stuff. I only know the accounting knowledge. I've never run a business. I don't know anything that comes along with that. I know, I don't know how to get clients. I've never tried before. I barely connected with anyone. It's just a whole different skill set that you have to figure out. There's no course on it. You can't YouTube it and figure out okay, this is a secret method. To get clients right i don't know it's a lot, probably a lot of clickbait titles like that but yeah they'll make you think so yeah <laughs> yeah and then you watch it you're more confused but <laughs> at the end of the day you just kind of have to figure it out for yourself but then when i was working for like government organization and because they say in accounting there's many different routes you can go you might like it more it might be more your pace at the end of the day it's still boring it's all, like for real like it's, it's for me, right? Just sitting in front of that screen and and having someone, I don't know, tell you what to do or whatnot, because you can't necessarily choose who you're working with. You'll do one interview. You might not work with that person anymore, or they might not actually yeah. be working closely with you. You might be with another team. You might be having a different manager. 
and sometimes it well in my head like i i didn't necessarily agree with everything that the way things were running or then the results of how we're making decisions and things like that if it felt really resistant to change yeah so i didn't like it just wasn't something that i wanted to do and there were certain things that i felt like i could have done or found or could have done differently with the processes but it was just never going to get acknowledged or changed so i just had enough and i was a bit burnt out to doing both like going going home and then working on the business stuff that i'm trying to do i was able to pick up some clients oh you did at the same time originally yeah so like when i was working not at the firm but when i was working at the government yeah organization i started off like building a website trying to build a little logo whatever you see today right I just kind of built it all myself, just tried to get all that stuff there, get some business cards. And then, yeah, I let everybody know, all right, like, I'm doing this. If you know anybody, feel free to send them my way. So, yeah, just letting people know that I'm out there doing it, open for business. So, slowly, a couple things came through like that, right? But nothing too active because it was difficult to do both. So, yeah, at I'm that curious, point, oh, sorry, I'm curious if you had some metric in your mind here, because I hear two things, right? There is one you kind of, I know, in pre prior episode, we talked about like this hustle culture. So kind of sounds like you did your side gig while you're doing kind of like your primary gig, right? And I'm curious, I'm, I wonder if there was some metric of income there before you felt comfortable, kind of like, I guess, leaving your primary job. And another topic you were mentioning about was more just like domain knowledge, right? How did you know that you had enough domain knowledge before you're like, okay, I'm just going to stop. That's enough knowledge. I can kind of stand on my own now. Yeah. So for the domain knowledge, like the technical stuff, it's just, I made sure I had that before I left the firm. Mm -hmm. You're not going to know everything. Like, there's so many different things out there, but as long as you know how to learn, then I think you're good right you you know what to do to get get things to where they need to be and then let's say there's a hundred percent of what you can know of something if you know 95 percent, you're good in my opinion there's someone else that can do the other five percent if it need be um you're never gonna know the hundred percent people work like 30 years and they don't know the hundred percent whole life thing, yeah yeah the other thing is like i think people get too hung up on experience in years there's people that work 20 years that don't know anything don't know much right people that work two years and they know a ton it just depends on how hungry they are how much effort they put in what kind of questions they ask if as you're coming up in your job or your career you're constantly asking like targeted questions about what you want to know you're going to learn something much faster than if you're just waiting around for it to come fall on your lap getting exposure to a certain file or something so i I tried to do that and then I just got to a point where I felt comfortable with learning how to find information and knowing where to find it and also just the base, uh, the knowledge that I needed for like a certain segment, which is owner managed businesses, just servicing them just felt, felt really good with it, felt really comfortable with it. A lot of it's like tax planning. So a big thing is like, what does an owner managed business want? Well, you need to know the solid accounting foundation. You know how to reconcile things. You need to know how to determine how much money they should pay themselves from their corporation to themselves personally, what the different attributes of that would be, like what you need to consider, the different tax rules, and things like that. And tax is not stagnant. It's always changing. So someone could spend 15 years getting very familiar with it, but if they need someone to keep spoon feeding it to them, what are they going to do tomorrow when it changes and they've off on their own and no one's there, right? So, yeah, that's just kind of like how I approached it. And like I the felt... secret power, right, for learning how to learn, sort of. You're describing something super... I'm biased because I have that same mentality, but learning how to learn is so crucial because the rules change. And then when the rules change, how do you adapt, right? I think a very simple example would be a programming language. How many programming languages exist out there? Even a good employer will figure out that 
a, a, a suitable programmer, even if they have no prior knowledge with that language, they're going to be able to pick it up. And you can tell just based on talking to them. So it's almost like, now I hate, I think this is a bastardized term now, but thinking from first principles, you can figure it out, right? That's kind of like part of your superpower. You can just figure it out. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing because even if you look at these textbooks in school, that's essentially what the teacher is doing, just teaching you from the textbook. You can learn the same thing by just opening it yourself without the teacher in most cases. Maybe you want to have someone to ask questions to, but there's always a way to to figure it out, I think. And that's, I think when you ask anyone, any business owner, someone who's done anything in business, you know, did you feel like you were completely ready? I don't think anybody feels completely ready, right? You just take that, take a bit of a leap. That's a nice little segue, actually, back to uh, Matthew's first question about did you have a metric, but also, because I'm trying to think from the perspective of someone listening that is so hesitant to take that leap, what were your first steps to mold your, your mind into being like, I can do this? What sort of level of comfort were you able to give yourself? Was it a metric? Was it time? Was it timing? Uh, I don't know if you're yeah. able to explain on that. I think it's, you're never going to feel completely comfortable. And I think the hard part for me was just feeling uncomfortable because I don't necessarily like uncomfortable situations. I don't think anybody really does, but that's always how it's going to be, right? If you're wanting to do something, I think you just have to be just be confident with what you know or what you have to evaluate yourself and see you know do i know enough of this do i know enough that i can actually do a, a good job or a really good job or do i only know enough that i'll do some mickey mouse like mediocre job right so i think that is like the first thing and then i think you can't compare yourself to anybody either you can't you can't come go and look at the best guy at the, one of the most knowledgeable people at, that you work with uh, and say, well, I don't know that much or I, I haven't, I don't know how to manage things like they manage it because that's the race is just between you and yourself, right? So you'll learn to, to learn what you need to know or you'll ma manage things differently. So I think if somebody is on the fence about making that leap or making a jump, I think if you're comfortable with what you know, your what you need to know to do what you want to do, then just try it. What's the worst that could happen? You come back and you do your day job again. But it's better than not doing it and living a life of regret. Like, oh, I wonder what would have happened if I did this. That's also looking at what's on the horizon. Right now, if, you know, you, you don't have kids or anything, it's a lot easier to make that jump than if you waited a bit, you had kids, you had more real responsibilities. For me, I had no real responsibility, right? So I, it wasn't, there wasn't anything on that end that I had to think about, but I kind of did it in a bit of a not, I did it in a bit of like a slow conservative way because I started on the side. I didn't fully jump in. My metric that I would use uh, for me in the back of my head was uh, I just want to replace my income with the side thing before I jump in full time. But I learned that it was that was difficult because you can't really put the time to both your first priority, obviously, is just working your day job. And then you have to work your side thing. And it's not necessarily working. You're, you're wearing all those different hats, figuring out how to get clients maybe networking a bit, making an article, I don't know, whatever it might be. And then there's the client work to, to go along with it, right? So I, I started to burn out a little bit from that. Just doing it because in between as well, after finishing BCIT, you start working and then you do the CPA program while you're working. So over that time span, you're working and doing some school. It's not like a ton of stuff all the time, but it's an extra layer of things. So from that time period, it was always just kind of like, go, 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 go. And then just with the stuff at this other job, just wasn't really happy with it. I I felt that I didn't want to 
do accounting for someone else. And in my head, there was never an option that you just quit your job. Like, it just sounds stupid, but it just didn't click for me. It wasn't like, oh, I hate it. I, I could just quit and then try this. I was too conservative. I needed more of a safety net or something. I needed more assurance on it. But my wife now, who's my girlfriend, was just like, if you don't like it, just quit uh, and then start do your business full time. And I was like, what, what do you mean just quit? Like, that's, not, <laughs> that's not an option. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think that was? I, I understand the safety net. So financially, I think most people can relate to that. Do you think there is something else there that's holding you back as well? Is there some sort of guilt or something like shame or was there fear? I guess fear, right? But yeah, yeah what else was there? I guess it was just like fear is one thing. And then it's also like, I don't know. At the time, I was also living at home still. So it, I didn't want to seem like I was doing nothing. Like my my parents would be like, oh, man, this guy quit his job. He's just, <laughs> just sitting around now watching TV <laughs> while we're taking care of him. It's <laughs> really right? a good so, deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right? Stay at home, son. That's my full time job. <laughs> <laughs> that's a new one. Let's 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 make that mainstream. Yeah, but yeah, I mean that was pretty much it. And yeah, I guess what well, there was never a period I wasn't in school or working or anything, so it just felt like I had to keep building on the side before I could just jump in full time. And also, I wanted to keep accumulating money. Right, it's not cheap living in Vancouver. <laughs> Oh, man. Surrey or wherever, right? Yeah. So that was a big thing. But then eventually she said that, and I just said, "Yeah, I'm, I I was really fed up with it. I just really didn't like it. So I just went in. I th thought about it over the weekend, went in, quit, I'll give me two weeks or whatever, and then it was full time in the business, and it was super scary because now it's a real thing. It's not just a side thing. It's a real thing. There's no oh what like. It's, it's what you're doing full time. There's no backup or whatever. Can you take us back? Can you, are you able to put yourself back into that exact moment when it hit you where you're like, holy cow, I'm doing this. Like we're going yeah. now. Like what, what did that feel like? What was, can you describe it a little bit? Yeah. It felt good, I guess. It felt bad and good at the same time. It felt, <laughs> felt like a little bit like, scared i guess like a little bit guilty in a way but it felt like there was like this huge weight off my shoulders because i think if you're in an industry or a job that you don't like uh you don't have to do it and it sounds so stupid just saying it saying that you don't have to do it but i think a lot of people like myself who are in those jobs or those positions just don't see that as an option, like not doing it, right? It's just like, I have to do it. I have to get another similar job in the same industry. But you could sw switch industries. You could do something completely different because if you're mentally, like you're not happy there, why are you doing it, right? There's different measures of success. So some people might view success in monetary terms where, you know, if you're making a lot of money, then you're successful. But like, what if you're making a lot of money and you hate your life doing it? Like you're not happy, you're not enjoying your time, you're working a ton of hours. What's the point, right? There's people who are super happy with nothing. And like, what, what's the real measure of success? Is it money or is it how you feel? So I think that is what switched in me. And, it was a discovery um, along the way. Like, it would, would you say that discovery happens only after you decided to fully commit? Or did that discovery already dawned on you while you were doing your full-time nine to five. I think it only really happened after, after I decided I was, wow. I was going to, to quit because it, yeah, it just felt like it wasn't even an option quitting. Like, yeah, it's I don't relatable. know why it's, it's relatable. Like, yeah. Yeah. I needed someone to push me because I feel from my background or like, whatnot it's more so you get a good job and you stay there and you work hard we we'll collect your pension or whatever yeah and you know 30 years you're, you're gonna get paid for life 
But the first 30 years, I'm, I don't want to hate my life, right? So you relatable, even, man. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? You might never collect that pension, right? So yeah, yeah my gr uh, wife at the time, my girlfriend, she has like a bit of a different mindset on things. I think very, I guess I would say like more analytical. Any decision I make, I really have to think about it. Like I, it could be like buying a pencil. I'm going to watch a YouTube video on it. Oh, I'm like that too. <laughs> I risk, it doesn't matter. I have to think about it, right? But she's kind of more just like, do it, right? Just why not do it? And uh, yeah, she just said, if you hate it so much, what's the worst that can happen? Uh, just do it. And I was thought about it. And uh, I guess I just did it. And that's at that point, uh, I felt like I was free. I said to her, I said, you know, probably not going to be going out for dinner or anything. <laughs> yeah. She said, okay, it's fine. Frozen pasta. I guess coming from that analytical mindset, like that is a big jump. And I, I could only put myself in your shoes. It's like so many people are trained on getting this paycheck every two weeks. And it's like, oh, shoot. Now it's you open up your bank account. You're like, oh, there's no deposit today. <laughs> that must have... Yeah. <laughs> That must have felt pretty scary, but like, did you define what potentially failure could mean for you? And then you'd be like, oh crap, you know, the worst thing did happen and now I have to go back to my day job. Did you know what that would look like or did you just kind of um, like go guns blazing in there? You know what? I thought about it a bit. I think end, end of the day, I, if, it, if this didn't work out, I don't know if I would have wanted to go back into the same industry, like the accounting industry. I think I would have wanted to do something a little different. I feel like I'm like I'm good at it. I, like I I like the stuff. I like it more in a sense of what I can do with it rather than sitting there and for somebody telling me how to do it or what to do for a company. It's just not work now when I'm I'm called do whatever I want, work with people, I can build the relationship just the way I want with them like I, I can feel like I'm truly helping them or providing some kind of value beyond that rather than just like sitting there behind the computer, plugging away at stuff, right? So I try not to think about the failure too much. That was kind of more of my mindset on it. I know my dad asked me, you know, what are you going to do if it doesn't work out? And I said, I don't know. Stay at home, son. Yeah, go back to work. Withdraw <laughs> <laughs> money from your bank account. <laughs> Goodbye, RRSPs. Yes. Okay, so I kind of want to just address the sign in the back. So we've been talking about your business, but you got a nice little plaque in the back. So TSB CPA, that's the name of your business. Yeah. In corporate and crypto taxation. So I will just say that I met you because I was looking for an accountant. And you made posts on Reddit. I wanted to ask you specifically, did you ever think that, you know, because we actually have to do outreach soon too. Did you think that Reddit would take off the way it did for you? No. So it wasn't even in my head that it would take off like that. It's just part of trying to get clients, figure out different ways to put myself out there. I'm not super big on just networking with other professionals. I just don't feel like it's for myself, like genuine. I just have a, something I should probably should be doing, but I have a harder time with it. So I, instead I was doing different things like, I don't know, posting on different pla social platforms, just going door to door, different local businesses. And then I was like, why not throw it on Reddit? There's such a big community on there. So I think I threw a, I made the post, a, a big guide on cryptocurrency tax, which is one aspect of what I do. And I, I put it on like personal finance, Canada and um, that was the one. Yeah. yeah big, and then I guess a lot of people found it helpful and they ended up, it ended up getting sticky to the top for like quite a while. So when you open that forum, it was, it's right up there at, at the top, got a ton of viewers from that. And yeah, I mean, it's just, I guess just try different things, see what, see what works. That's what I was trying to do. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I guess from there, it's, that, was, that was probably, that was some content that people were interested in, I guess, at the but time. I'm, curi yeah. I'm curious too, were you always tech savvy? Cause like, I mean, one of the, one of the appeals when Drew made the referral was just like, 
down. Like I'm going through Tristan's systems. He's, he's not using like, you know, some some big name like document, you know, DocuSign. He's using like Panda Sign. Like, what the hell is a Panda Sign? <laughs> I was like, wow, this guy is so into like startup technologies. Like <laughs> it, it, it's, it's true. Like you, 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 I'm curious. Yeah. Where did you get this tech savviness from? Because like it's something that I, I really admire you for just coming from a tech background. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm a, a bit of a like a tech guy to an extent. Like I like Android phones. Back in the day in high school, I used to like root my phone and like put different like custom ROMs or whatever they call it on it. Yeah. And then always every time I would do something like that, it'd be a huge mess up. I'd like take me <laughs> ten times longer. So I wouldn't say I'm like tech <laughs> technically inclined, but just like, looking at those things. I was just looking for things that would make the processes easier. And I run my firm as a virtual firm. So I want everything to be easy in terms of e-signing or preparing the files, easy access, all virtual based, right? So a lot of people do use things like DocuSign, but, you know, PandaDoc works just as well. And yeah, even bookkeeping and stuff for people. And what I recommend is online platforms like QuickBooks, because what if you need to share that with your accountant? They can easily just log in. It's so much quicker. It's just so much more efficient. And a lot of firms aren't into that because they're, they've been around for so long that they have all their established processes. They've grown to an extent. They've done everything with their clients in one way that it's so hard to change it now. Or honestly, they don't care how to change it. I've never looked into these things. That's probably the case, right? But when you're growing from nothing, um, and in this day and age, there's a lot of improvements you can make. Like I'm sure every client would prefer e-signing rather than, okay, here's a document, print it out, scan it, sign it back or send it back to me. Right. It's just more efficient on, on either end. But yeah, that's just a goal. I was just trying to streamline things. And I'm kind of glad that Matthew brought that up because, uh, I think one thing, uh, actually, I want to highlight two things. One thing is that we did talk about crypto and we're not going to go too deep into it because it's a very polarizing topic. But one thing that people may not know is that the tax laws for crypto are absolutely crazy. They're so complex and there's no real way to navigate them firmly because it's such a novel technology. So that's one thing that your Reddit post was, it was able to clearly articulate here are the rules that we know and this is the best we can do. And this is my honest approach. And it was very like, you didn't seem arrogant. You didn't seem overconfident. You seemed cautious enough and you were able to answer everyone's questions, right? And you, there was an air of honesty versus like when I was consulting some other accountants, I always felt like there were some things they were unsure of, but they were unwilling to say, I don't know. So one thing I appreciate about you is that when something you don't know straight up, you just tell me, I don't know, right? And I'm going to look into it for you. And I love that, right? And you were telling me all these ways that like, oh, you can manage your corporation this way and this way. And so when I started consulting, I came to you for that because I remembered our conversation. And I think, I don't know, we've alluded to episode one, Albert's episode a few times here. But one thing I mentioned on there was charisma. And one thing that you did was it, it, you made me feel comfortable whereas everyone else i spoke to i just felt like i i don't feel comfortable talking to these people right where did you learn that value to be that way you're you're humble but you're assertive you're knowledgeable but you're not afraid to say i don't know what was that always in you as a personality trait or what was that i don't know to be honest it's <laughs> i guess there's some people in certain roles, I guess, and just working with other professionals as I was coming up in my career. I, it's like some, sometimes there's like a bit of arrogance if with, with some people and you don't feel comfortable discussing things with them or, or just asking them a question and learning from them. Um, it's almost like they belittle you or something like that, or, or like, well, why doesn't this guy know this? Why is he even asking me a question? And then I just want people to feel comfortable when I'm talking to them, I don't like putting pressure on people. Like I don't, I don't want to frame my conversations around, oh, you know, you have to use my service. I've given you all this like X, Y, Z yeah. information. And 
if I don't know something, then I need to like, just honestly, you need to t tell someone you need to look into that. I'm not sure, or like, there's not like, a clear guide guidance on this from CRA. These are the different avenues and these are different risks attached to it. Because at the end of the day, you're giving somebody advice. They're going to rely on it when, when they get audited or if they get audited, they've relied on the advice or the conversations they've had with you. It's important that just to keep everyone on side with the CRA that they that they know those things and also if people don't feel comfortable talking to you they're not going to tell you everything about the situation they're not going to ask you questions i've had a lot of people like clients of mine tell me that their previous accountant didn't explain things to them yeah and i guess the one thing is well you, you could have asked you should, maybe you could have asked them more about it but they probably didn't feel comfortable asking the accountant and for me I only know what the stuff I know because I did this, I went this route. If I was your average business owner and I didn't have this background, I wouldn't know any of these things. I'd have no idea what, what to do on the tax end, the accounting end. So I just try to think of it from that perspective. It's funny you mentioned about the, the way the other accounts make them feel. One feeling I always got was I'm on the clock. I think yeah. that's where a lot of the discomfort comes from. It's like, oh, I, I'm getting billed for every minute that I'm on this call. And I mean, it still happens for a variety of other services. But one thing I really appreciate about you is you went above and beyond for, for me when I had made no promises to you already that I was going to be your client, right? And you know what's even funnier is that I wasn't your client for a long time. But because we spoke so many times... I had this inherent trust for you. And I was like, you know, if there's one accountant I could trust for my corporation, it'd be, it'd be Tristan. Right. And that's, I don't know if this is, this is definitely more of like a, you know, we're talking about ourselves here. There's three people here. There's no, there's no recipe for this, but there really is that sense of charisma and that trust building. Cause now I, I told Matthew, I'm like, you're looking for an accountant for corporate tax. Like this is your guy, you know, that's his bread and butter. So Dude, I just, I just wanted to applaud you for that. And I don't know if you have anything to elaborate on on what that was. Maybe that was just the way you were raised. Be kind to people and treat them human. I don't know. Maybe. I, I, I don't know. I guess it's that's, that's the goal too. Just be genuine. I don't just want to have someone as a client. Like I want to have a genuine good relationship with them as well. It's a relationship of mutual respect, right? So... That's the whole point of these calls, just so I can get an understanding of the situation and what the need is, and then also see, would this be a good fit on, on both sides? Because it's not just about the money, like billing people, it's about providing a good service. You know, some people spend thousands of dollars on, on ads, and that's how they get their clients. But for me, I just want to do a good job, have a good reputation of what I do, just be known for quality. And that's kind of how it goes, right? Just word of, mouth, word of mouth marketing. If I do a good job for you, you know, you'll refer, you'll refer Matthew and uh, maybe Matthew will refer someone. So it's just like, that's, I think, how you build a long-term business. And that's what I want to be known for, right? Like TSB, like, that's my initials. My name is the firm, right? So yeah. that's all, all I want. Just, just have good, genuine connections, do a good job and make people... Um, want to be my client for the long run, right? I'm not necessarily looking to pick up a client for one year. I want to do a good job so, so someone will want to be my client for the duration of their life, for their business. Thanks for that answer. That's, that's amazing. I, I think in the interest of time, actually, I wanted to ask this question about more for a prospective business owner again. Because I think the picture we've painted right now is something that is, it's almost like magical. It was the transition from the full-time job into the business. But what, are, what do you think some lessons were that you learned that are, if you could go back, you could give yourself some advice or were there some bumps in the road or hardships you felt along this way before you, you know, achieve that, what do you call it, like the snowball yeah, you know, it wasn't it wasn't just like jumping in and all of a sudden it's a success. Once I quit my job, 
the only thing in my head was how am I going to expand, grow the business, get clients, get all my processes where they need to be. You're, you're building everything from scratch, all your processes, the softwares you use, the everything you do, your client acquisition, you need to build some articles, like some kind of reputation behind yourself as a firm. So that just consumed me constantly. I think when you run a business, sometimes when you're not doing something to get grow your business or working on it, kind of feel guilty in a way. You feel like, oh, I should have... I should be putting more effort into this. I shouldn't be doing this. I should be working on this if I really want to grow and succeed. And that's kind of where, where I was at. Having said that, though, doing that stuff, it brings some results, obviously. Like you're, you're picking up clients, you're doing different things, you're putting yourself out there. But you can, I learned that you can't do that. Like you can't think that way you're just going to burn out. It's going to get too stressful. Even if you're not working on client stuff, wearing all those hats and just like finding clients or researching or doing all these different things just takes a lot of energy. So I had to step back and, and change my thinking to look only at tomorrow or today, actually, sorry, only looking at what I'm going to do today. So, okay, this is what I'm going to do today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Next day is what I'm going to do today. Don't worry about tomorrow. And that, once I did that, then things started to change. I felt way better. I felt I was more productive. I was getting more things done. I was getting better results. And then things kind of just started falling into place, I, I guess, for like lack of better words. Yeah, but I would say don't worry about six months, 12 months. Write down your goals, whatever, whatever it may be. Continue to evaluate them. But... All you can do is what, what you're going to do today. So just know what you're going to do today. Do it. Don't worry about it because the stress is always going to be there. And then you're going to hit your goal. You're going to be where you want. You said you want to be when you first started. And it's not going to be good enough. It's always been, okay, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. Um, but I think it's really important that you have to take a step back, see what, appreciate what you've done, and uh, just kind of celebrate that a bit. Great. So... How did you learn to do that, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah. I don't know. It's just, it's hard, like, just through trial and error, just through the way you're feeling. Uh, I read this book. Everyone probably mentions this book called The Secret. I'm not sure if you heard of it. Who's your... Uh, Rhonda Byrne or something. It's on my okay. bookshelf over there. But essentially what this book is it's just the law of attraction. Every page pretty much just says the same thing. Your mindset, whatever you're, you're thinking is going to happen. If you're thinking positive things, it will happen. If you're thinking negative things, it's going to happen. It's, it's gonna, you're not going to get to your, your goal, right? Because it frames your mind. If my concern is, oh, you know, what if I don't make, what if I don't do this? Like, what if I can't get the clients? What if I can't build this business what am i going to do i'm not going to be as productive i'm not i'm not going to be in the like, same state of mind that if i'm like tomorrow i'm going to get a new client or i'm going to put out this crazy article and just post it somewhere and get a bunch of traction right it sounds stupid you know just saying you're going to do something but i think the more from what i've learned the more you say that the positive thoughts that you have it's going to help you a lot more and you're, you're, you're going to get there because the only thing that l really limits you in my opinion is your mind yeah. right like what if you make some crazy goal and everybody laughs at you it's a little stupid why is this guy even saying that what if you achieve even half of that right set the bar high just think you can do it and then you'll probably land you might you might do it you might land somewhere around there but that's, that really helped. And then there's another book I, I read. The guy's name is Naval Ravikant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, like some old man. Matthew's sick of me mentioning him. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was some book. It's called The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. And I don't know what it is, what was in that book. The things that he was writing about really resonated with me. And yeah, like, a, really changed like the way I was thinking 
I think like just being aware of things that the perspectives of others and like amalgamating that with my view on it really helped change things. So I think I had to just open my mind a bit, right? To different possibilities, experiences, ways of thinking, because uh, my whole life, I just had this one set way of thinking and it's, it's just influenced by how you grow up or the people you're around or whatever, but there's so much other ideas or thoughts or ways of thinking that you can surround yourself with or you can be open to that can really help you, right? And there's some things that I would probably say, oh, it's stupid. I would have never thought that way or never done that or whatnot, but I do it now. And there's other things too. You can journal or whatever, just write all that stuff out, just anything that could work. I would say those are things that help get you geared for the day and just help alleviate some of the stress, things like that. But you just have to take yourself out of the situation a bit. Like you have to learn how to step back and just look at everything as a whole first. Because when you're doing something, it's just tunnel vision. You're in there and uh, the time passes. You might be doing the same stuff all the time. Yeah, I still get caught up in that. I mean, especially right now, we're in October. I feel like the last three months are just... I don't even know what, what has happened to them. <laughs> but the, it's just but that's me recognizing I need to kind of step back and take a look at things. That's some powerful stuff, man. <laughs> I think we could we could go into that for an hour from here. But yeah, there's a lot of mindfulness, present-minded, present way of thinking. I don't even know how to say that properly. But just being in the present and all these like spiritual techniques, like there's a whole can of worms there. But I'm glad you found your way, man. Like it, those, it was very powerful what you just said. So thanks for that. What I'm gonna do first is I'm actually gonna I'm gonna do the usual question. I don't know. We usually ask each guest the same question of how do you define fulfillment. So I'll ask you that, and then I'll do the ending, and then we can continue chatting and we can count it toward recording. We can do it off air or whatever we want to, whatever we want to have happen. But, yeah, uh, I can even stop the recording to be honest, and we can keep chatting because I, I have a bunch of things I wanted to ask you about. <laughs> yeah, well, sounds good. These are all uh, billable hours. <laughs> <laughs> you changed. <laughs> you changed. <laughs> oh, Bill <Bull> Matthew. <laughs> oh no. This is this is, this is karma for all the free ones you gave me. This is, this is it's all catching up now. <laughs> oh, just kidding. <laughs> I know it's hilarious though. You you probably should bill me. <laughs> no, it's a, this is a, it's this is a good experience. So it's not, it's cool like hanging with you guys talking about this stuff and and stuff. You guys actually need to do a podcast where you guys talk about. Well, you don't need to up like up to you, but like it'd be cool to hear about you like yeah, what your guys' background is and all that stuff because you ask all us these questions and it's interesting. But I'm sure you guys have really interesting backgrounds as well like matthew getting thinking about getting sucked into a printer <laughs> was tired so. <laughs> right, there's some interesting thoughts going on there we were going to save it for a milestone episode but everyone keeps saying that too so i might release a trailer but it's going to be quite heavy it's not going to be it's just going to be more like why we're doing this but yeah i think for our episodes we we might actually save it for a special one because i don't know it's weird but uh, I never really thought of the show about being about us. It's always about trying to help others through a diverse amount of stories, right? And it may, maybe, it, maybe the strategy is if they listen to all of them, they get bits and pieces of us. <laughs> yeah. Because we talked about ourselves a little bit today. We can bring Bert and Tristan back to interview us. The, the yeah. double accountants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so Tristan, before we end the show, I needed to ask you, we ask every guest this question, but how would you define fulfillment or what does fulfillment mean to you? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's different for everyone and changes all the time. But I mean, I, like, I think it's just like, are you happy? It's just as simple as that. Right? How do you feel about yourself? The things you do? You know, the stuff you're doing on the day to day, is it influencing your happiness or is it detracting from that? And you can't change necessarily what you're doing exactly, but you can make certain tweaks that can change things a little bit. 
right? Um, I don't think like fulfillment for me is can be measured in terms of money. It's also hard to say that it shouldn't be because you need money to survive. And the more money you have, the more comfortable of life you can have, the more the different things you can do. But, uh, you know, when you're on the pursuit of it, if you're working 60 hours a week or like 50 hours a week or something and you're making a lot of money, are you having time to enjoy it as yeah. much? Right. And are you going to live as long? Maybe not because it's just stressful. So, yeah, I think just looking back, seeing if things I'm doing are making me happy, if I'm, if I'm learning some new things that I want to do, that's pro that's, that's pretty much it. Am I spending time with people I want to? Yeah, like my actions reflecting like how I want them to. Not they not they don't they are not always they oh I don't know. They're not always reflecting that. But I guess just recognizing it and seeing if anything different can be done. But yeah, that's that's pretty much it. That's how I would I would define it for myself. And I think I used to kind of see it more as a pursuit, but I think it should be like a state. Yeah, you can't, you can't like chase it. You know, you're always going to be chasing it, but it's easier said than done. Yeah, straight up. <laughs> well, Tristan, uh, we were actually really looking forward to this episode and it really lived up. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And yeah. maybe we'll thank have you, you again. on again. <laughs> yeah, I no, appreciate it. I'd love to. Thanks for listening to me ramble on. <laughs> so, hopefully there's some useful stuff, but yeah, I appreciate you guys giving me the chance to come on the podcast.